899 and Alfred the Great of Wessex is dead. Throughout his life he built up the Kingdom of Wessex from this to this, managing to turn Mercia into what was essentially a puppet state. Alfred was succeeded by his son Edward, better known as Edward the Elder, but if you want to be very Anglo-Saxon about it, which you do, his name was Aedweard. Ethelwald, who was the son of Alfred's brother and predecessor Ethelred, revolted against Edward, claiming the throne for himself. Fortunately for Edward, Ethelwald's revolt did not come to much. To summarise, Ethelwald fled Wessex and managed to gain the support of the Danes in East Anglia in attacking Wessex, but he was killed at the Battle of the Holm, which was probably about here. Barring Ethelwald, very little is known about the early reign of King Edward, and information of him doesn't become clear until 911 when Ethelred, the Lord of Mercia, died. Edward then seized these Mercian lands, which notably included London. Shortly afterwards, he marched into East Anglia and seized all of these lands with the help of the local Angles. After this, Ethelred's widow and Edward's sister, Ethelfled, ruled over Mercia and together with Edward began to put pressure on the neighbouring Danelaw. Over most of the next decade, Ethelfled built fortified burrs across Mercia, many of which were designed to protect against raids from the Norse Vikings based in Dublin and on the Isle of Man. Edward also oversaw the construction of burrs such as the one at Buckingham and one at Maldon in his newly conquered territories. The most important year for Anglo-Saxon expansion was 917. Up north, Ethelfled conquered all of this territory, including Derby and its surrounding territories. Shortly afterwards, Edward conquered all of East Anglia and captured the city of Grantabridge, or Cambridge as it's now known. The only remnants of the Danelaw were the Kingdom of York and the remaining four of the five boroughs. Leicester was the next borough to fall when Ethelfled secured his surrender in 918 without a fight. At this time, the Vikings of York made the offer of an alliance to Ethelfled to defend against Norse raiders, but she died before anything could come of it. Ethelfled's daughter, Elfwyn, was supposed to take over as Lady of Mercia, but she was booted out, presumably by Mercians who wanted to retain their independence. This didn't happen, and Edward annexed all of Mercia in the same year. Soon after this, Edward ventured into the Danelaw again, and in 918 he took these territories, and by the end of 920 he'd secured the remaining Danish strongholds and expanded his kingdom to all of the lands south of the Humber. Those on the periphery of this newly enlarged Anglo-Saxon kingdom found themselves having to choose between resisting or submitting. In 920 or 23, depending on which version you read, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle claims that the King of the Scots and all the people of the Scots and Ragnald and all who lived in Northumbria, both English and Danish, Norsemen or other, and also the King of the Strathclyde Welsh and all the Strathclyde Welsh chose him as father and lord. So by the end of Edward's reign, the Kingdom of Wessex looked like this, with roughly these areas pledging allegiance to Edward. Edward himself died in 924 and was succeeded by his son, Ethelstan, whose best known achievement occurred only three years into his reign when he captured the city of York and annexed all of Northumbria, including the non-Danish part. For many, this is considered the birth of England since the last remaining kingdom with a large population of Anglo-Saxons had been annexed. In the same year as his conquest of Northumbria, Ethelstan received the submission of the King of Scotland and the King of Strathclyde, much like Edward had. The reason for this was that submission was to a specific king and not to the kingdom itself, which meant that these submissions needed to be renewed. The peace between Ethelstan and the neighbouring kingdoms did not last forever, and in 934 it is known that Ethelstan invaded Scotland. Whether this was in retaliation for something or just an attempt to extend his kingdom is not known, though. None of the neighbouring kingdoms could resist on their own, and so Scotland, Strathclyde and the Kingdom of Dublin formed an alliance and they met Ethelstan at the Battle of Brunanburr. Brunanburr was extremely bloody and, importantly, a victory for Ethelstan, which cemented his position as the power in the British Isles. It is considered by some to be one of the most important battles in Anglo-Saxon history. Ethelstan was not merely a conqueror, though, and his reign saw a change in the nature of Anglo-Saxon government. Anglo-Saxon society was one dominated by the aristocracy and one with many social ranks. There were many nuances, but the nobility consisted primarily of two major ranks. The first was the elderman, who was generally in charge of a province called a shire, but some eldermen held several. The other major rank of nobility was that of the thane, who held smaller groups of lands. Both noble ranks had obligations to the king, such as providing troops, dispensing justice, building and maintaining bridges, as well as providing the church. In return for fulfilling these duties, nobles would expect rewards such as lands and privileges. The bulk of society consisted of lay people, the main group being the free peasants, called churls. Ethelstan's reign was also a period which saw an increase in Anglo-Saxon involvement in continental affairs. For example, when the West Frankish king Charles the Simple was deposed and imprisoned, his son Louis was given refuge. Ethelstan then helped the exiled Louis return to West Francia to take the throne and helped to keep him there. Another exiled prince called Hakon was helped by Ethelstan to take the throne of Norway from his older brother, Eric. Thus, Eric was exiled and fled to the British Isles and would eventually become a problem. Ethelstan wouldn't live to see this though, since he died in 939. He was succeeded by his half-brother Edmund, who had to deal almost immediately with a Norse invasion led by a man called Olaf Guthrufsson. Olaf seized York and invaded the Midlands, forcing Edmund to recognise him as the King of Northumbria and the sovereign of these lands. Olaf continued the long trend of Viking mortality and died in 941 and was succeeded by his cousin, also called Olaf. 
Soon after, Edmund began a reconquest of his lost territories. In 942, he retook the Midlands, and in 944, he drove Olaf out of Northumbria. Having reunited the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons, Edmund invaded the neighbouring kingdom of Strathclyde in 945 and basically set everything on fire. He took some of its southern lands, but agreed to give overlordship of Strathclyde to King Malcolm I of Scotland. As a result of the conquest of the Dane law, Edmund became known as the Liberator of the Danes, as apparently he'd rescued them from the harsh rule of the Norse, but the exact details of Norse rule are lost to time. Edmund's reign ended abruptly in 946 when he was either murdered by a thief or assassinated, no one knows for sure. Edmund was succeeded by his younger brother, Eadred, and shortly after this, in 947, the previously exiled Eric from Norway, better known as Eric Bloodaxe, conquered Northumbria. Eadred, Eric, and the previously driven out Olaf struggled for Northumbria over the next seven years, but in the end, Eadred decisively defeated Eric and reclaimed all of Northumbria. After this, Northumbria would permanently remain a constituent part of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom and later England. Not much else is known about Eadred's reign, which came to an end upon his death in 955. Eadred was succeeded by his nephew, the 15-year-old Eadwi, who immediately had a falling out with a prominent abbot called Dunstan, who subsequently fled to Flanders. Eadwi's reign was one plagued with the issues of loyalty. Not much is known about the exact quarrels, but a faction against King Eadwi was formed, which favoured his brother, Edgar, for the throne. In 957, the Elderman of East Anglia, Mercia and Northumbria declared for Edgar. Civil war was avoided when it was agreed by the nobility that the kingdom would be split. Eadwi would retain Wessex, whereas Edgar would get the rest, which seemed fair. This division wouldn't last long since Eadwi died two years later at the ripe old age of 19 and Edgar took over the entire kingdom. So Edgar is mostly known for the numerous reforms he undertook, both political and ecclesiastical. Edgar was not a conqueror like Alfred, Edward or Ethelstan, but he had the difficult task of keeping the newly formed Anglo-Saxon kingdom together and strengthening the king's hold over them. Much of this was done via legal codes and charters, and interestingly, Edgar allowed the laws previously established in the Dane law to remain in force. The reason for this was that forcing Anglo-Saxon laws onto an Anglo-Danish population could have caused resentment and potentially rebellion. Governing the realm was undertaken by the Viteniumot, which was a large royal council of nobles and churchmen which met regularly and decided on important matters of state such as the succession of kings and the passing of laws. This council travelled all around the kingdom instead of staying at the capital of Winchester. Under Edgar, the status of Eldermen increased, but they still had important administrative positions. Eldermen were appointed by the king and they held a shire for life. The position wasn't hereditary though, and upon the death of an Elderman, the land went back to the king to redistribute as he saw fit. The shire was the backbone of the administrative system, and the system implemented by Edgar lasted until its abolition in 1974. The shire was divided into hundreds or wapentakes if in the old areas of the Dane law, which had their own courts, which met monthly and was the unit of land used to assess the raising of troops. Shockingly, the hundred was made up of 100 hides of land with the exception of Wessex where it varied. The hundred was divided into the tithing which was made up of 10 hides and the households that lived upon them. Edgar's reforms were also economic and he oversaw the standardisation of the kingdom's coinage in 973. It was ordered that the coins were to be replaced every six years in order to reduce counterfeiting and that the coins had to bear the place it was minted and the money in charge of the mint on the back of their coins. Probably the most famous reform from Edgar's reign was his monastic reforms. Almost immediately after he became king, he recalled the abbot Dunstan, who became the Bishop of Worcester before becoming the Archbishop of Canterbury. Dunstan, along with Ethelwald, the Bishop of Winchester, and Oswald, the Archbishop of York, oversaw the reform of the monasteries. To simplify, it was believed that the holy houses were not sufficiently pious anymore, partly due to laziness and partly due to the fact that Vikings kept burning them down. During his exile, Dunstan came into contact with the European-wide Benedictine reform movement, which sought to restore the highly structured lifestyles of monks. Edgar provided a great deal of land and money towards this reform, although some of it was seized from his nobles. Land grants and donations were used to found new monasteries, whose residents adhered to the reformed rules, which were codified in a document called the Regularis Concordia. Whilst Edgar's reforms were important, Edgar's biggest achievement was keeping the Anglo-Saxon kingdom together. After Edgar, the unity of the kingdom was very secure, the nobility was more secure in their position, there had been decades of peace, and the kingdom's finances were much more stable. Edgar wasn't coronated king until the year 973, when he was 30 years old and 16 years into his reign. Shortly after this, the other kings within Britain came to Chester to personally pledge their allegiance to him. Edgar would only remain king for another two years when he died, leaving behind two young sons, Edward and Ethelred, who both had their backers. Edward won out, and in 978, three years into his reign, he was invited to see his brother and stepmother, Elfrith, in Corfay, where he was swiftly murdered upon his arrival, after which he was remembered as Edward the Martyr. His brother succeeded him as King Ethelred II, but he is better known as Ethelred the Unready, whose unfortunate rule and legacy will be examined next week. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching. There are some book recommendations in the description below if you'd like to know more.